He said, Wink, look at you. Look at your career. Look how well you've done. Look how successful you've become. And I thought, Elvis Presley is saying to me, look how well you've done. <laughs> well, you know, he was puffy. He didn't look good. And God only knows we knew that he probably was not going to have much more time on this planet. We left there that, that night and we went back to our hotel room, Eric. We closed the door behind us and, and we literally broke down and sobbed. We were, it, it, it hit us like a ton of bricks. And we just knew that that, I said, Sandy, that's the last time we're going to see him alive. Folks, sometimes I'm almost speechless. Today's one of those times. I'm sitting here in our TBN studio uh, with someone I've uh, been watching on TV for quite a few decades. Uh, his name is Wink Martindale. If you don't know who he is, don't touch that dial. Wink Martindale, just an honor to have you in the studio. Thank, Thank you, you, Eric. I think the first question must be, uh, you're, a, you're a TV personality, you're famous principally for game shows. We're gonna get into your relationship of uh, many years with Elvis Presley because this uh, week is the anniversary of his death 42 years ago, 1977. I remember where I was. Um, but the first question has to be, where did you get the name Wink? Well, I chose Wink because Alex, you cho Alex was already taken. You, cho <laughs> Sorry. you chose Wink. You chose Wink. Well, it's kind of funny because w uh, the name Wink Martindale, I remember even as a kid uh, watching the different game shows and seeing you on there. And I remember even as a kid thinking, Wink? Nobody's named Wink. That's a TV name. It's like a classic. If I could invent an animated uh, cartoon uh, <laughs> game show host, I would name him Wink Martindale, and when he smiled, you know, his teeth would gling, you know, it would just be, and I thought, this guy's name is really Wink, so I'm dying to know, how did you the, get the to truth, be named? The truth is that when I was a kid, seven or eight years old, in Jackson, Tennessee, growing up, I had a playmate, his name was Jimmy McCord. He's still living, lives in Humboldt, Tennessee, and he remembers this well. He had a little speech impediment in his voice, and what my real name was Winston, and yet when he said Winston, it came out sounding something like Winky. So I became the Winky Martindale on Burkitt Street in Jackson, Tennessee. And then when I got into the business, I shortened it to Wink, and it served me well. But I wish I had a better story than that, but that's exactly you know, the way it happened. But actually, uh, anything that's true is always stranger than fiction. I mean, I would have bet anything that that's a show business name, that when you were going into uh, game shows or something like that, because it's, it seems like an invented game show host name, and yet you're telling me it's the name you had since you were a kid. That's right, and let me tell you this regarding game shows. The very first network game show I did was at NBC. It was called What's This Song, which is a shortened version of a local show that I did on Channel 5 in L.A. called What's the Name of That Song? TV Guide needs shorter titles, so they called it What's This Song? Went on NBC, 1965, and you know the executives here in New York get paid the big bucks for making the big decisions. Well, Bob Aaron, who was in charge of daytime at NBC, thought that Wink was too juvenile sounding. So he made me win Martindale. He knocked off the K. And so for the first network game show that I did, I was win Martindale. I remember Steve Bailey, the, the announcer, used to say, oh, And here's the star of the show, win Martindale. And I'd look around and say, oh, my God, that's me. And then I'd run out. <laughs> well, win also sounds like a made-up name. But for not a game show. But quite as made up yeah. as Wink. I mean, in all seriousness, it's going to be hard for me to process that this is a name that you had as a kid. Now, Wink, I have to say also your voice. There's certain people that you say, that's a, that's a radio voice. That's an amazing show business voice you have. Now, I know you didn't work to get that voice. That is the voice God gave you. That's but correct. It, it, it's, it's always weird to me to think that people who have an ambition to go into radio uh, in many cases are born with what just sounds like a perfect radio voice. Yeah, and, and the amazing thing, Eric, is that over the years, my voice has not changed. Uh, I'd worked for 12 years for the cowboy, Gene Autry, at KMPC during the decade of the 70s. And I can take a, a piece of tape from one of my broadcasts from the 70s and put it alongside, cut it, edit in my voice today, 
and defy you to tell the difference. It's a God-given thing, and I feel blessed because usually as you age, your voice deteriorates or whatever you, whatever right. the word is, and my voice is the exact same as it was, if not better than it was then. Unbelievable. I uh, Up until about five years ago, when I sang, people, everybody thought it was Johnny Mathis, but my voice has changed. Um, <laughs> what was your Wink, biggest? I want to, oh gosh, I want to... Uh, Chances are, but that's uh, it was a cover. No, but I want to I want to uh, ask you. Wink is just a classic name, and it really does seem like an animated, invented uh, uh, character. So I feel like I'm invent I'm, I'm I'm meeting you know Bugs Bunny or somebody here. But you're very real. I can tell. <laughs> we talked before we went on the air about your about your faith, about your uh, relationship with Elvis Presley. Um, the reason we should we should start out here. Tons of people know about your background. Um, uh, in, in Hollywood and, and all the game shows, and I want to get into that, uh, but the reason you're here this week in particular is because uh, this is the 42nd anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley. Okay. I, I hadn't known of your relationship with him, so I, I do want to talk about that. Okay. How do you meet Elvis Presley? Well, um, my dream job in radio when I left Jackson was to be the morning man on WHBQ Radio in Memphis. Because all the kids in Jackson listened to WHBQ, came in like a local, and they played a lot of music. So I wanted to be on that station. Fade to black and come up on years later. Now I'm 18 years old, and I've got the clock watcher's job. But this night in 1954, Sam Phillips, who founded Sun Records, had walked in with an acetate, a record he had just cut that afternoon with his truck driver for Crown Electric Company named Elvis Presley. I thought, what a strange name. But I went in there. He played it once. He wanted to test it to see if he had anything. And Dewey could test a record. And if it made it overnight, if, they, if his listeners liked it, it could become a hit regionally oh, in Memphis yeah. overnight. What a world. He played it seven times in a row. Switchboard lit up. And I was the one asked to call Gladys and Vernon. They lived in low-rent housing called Lauderdale Courts. They were very poor out in East Memphis. And um, Wait, you were, you were chosen to call his parents? That's correct. You? Yeah. As a, you're a kid. I mean, you're right out of high school. Well, I was doing the morning show, and I happened to be there that night. I know. But I was in the control room, and Sam Phillips had the number. So he said, call Gladys and Vernon and find out where Elvis is, because Dewey wanted him to come down to the station. This is about as seminal as it gets. The yeah. fact that you were there, and not only there, but involved in uh, reaching out to his parents at the moment that his career, I, I think you could say, began to exist. Yeah. I dialed the number. She answered the phone. I said, Mrs. Presley. And they were listening to the show because they knew the record was going to be played. They were so excited. I said, Mrs. Presley, Dewey would like for Elvis to come down to the station. Where is he? And she said he was so nervous about his record being played, he went to see a double feature Western. He's at the Suzor's Theater on Decatur Street. That's where you'll find him. They got in their truck and they went and walked up and down the dark aisles. There was Elvis sitting all by himself watching a Western movie, whispered to him about what was going on down the street at the Chisco Hotel on South Main Street at WHBQ. They got in the truck, came down. I met him that night and he became my friend and was my friend until the day he died. But little did we know. I mean, we had no way of knowing because people have asked me over the years, did you know magic was happening that night? And there was no way, I, I still get chills talking about it. There was no way that we could know that that evening, that July evening in 1954, music was changing and would change for all time. In the morning, I was playing Perry Como, Joe Stafford, K Starr, uh, you know, what I call Eddie Fisher, what I call vanilla music. Eddie Fisher. Eddie Fisher. You didn't think you were going to hear when, that. When's today, the last folks? time you Did heard you? that name? <laughs> Eddie Fisher. So um, in the morning, that's what I was playing. We weren't allowed to play the stuff that Dewey was playing at night. But. After that's all, Mom, all right, Mama was introduced that night and became a hit. That was the song. That was the song that started it all. He didn't even have a B side to put out for that's all, Mama. All right, Mama was the song. That's that all right. On the, that's all right, Mama was yeah. the song that put him on the map. And they went in the following Thursday and recorded the B side, which was Blue Moon of Kentucky, and uh, that was the now, first record. And we know why it was the B side because yeah. we haven't heard of it. What, are there any Elvis songs we haven't heard of? I guess that's one. I mean, honestly, I didn't know this story, and. You know, because you, you hear versions of how people became famous, but the idea that it was one 
night uh, in the summer of 1954 mm -hmm. on a Memphis radio station that, that this happened. Now, how old was Elvis at that time? He would have been, um, let's see, he would have been 20. 20 years old. Yeah. He was Either a 20 kid. or 21, yeah. He was a kid. So yeah. you must have been, what, 19 or something? I'm a year older than he is. Oh, you yeah. are? All right. Well, that's, I mean, 20-year-old Elvis, we can hardly imagine. We've seen photographs uh, of him. So you were friends with him from 1954 until his death in 1977. This is the 42nd anniversary of his death. And you just said to me that he was 42 when he died. Yeah. During this year, 2019, he will have been gone for as long as he was with us on this earth. It, it's hard to imagine. It is truth. really, really hard to imagine. I remember where I was uh, in 1977 that summer. I remember all the newspapers. It, it, you know, uh, if you were alive at that time, you remember... Uh, when Elvis died. I want to uh, ask you, you were going to read something, and I want to talk to you more about your friendship with, with Elvis uh, Presley, who died this week, 42 years ago. Unbelievable to think it's that long. But you had something you wanted to, to read about him. Yeah. Uh, one can make the case, Eric, that he's as popular, if not more so, uh, today than ever. Graceland is among the country's top tourist attractions, seems to break attendance records every year. This is a narrative that I recorded in celebration of Elvis's uh, birthday earlier this year. And I call it Heavenly Child. And it describes the early Elvis that his mom Gladys gave birth to on January 8th, 1935. In the year of our Lord, 1935, during the first month known as January, it was the eighth day God was sitting pondering, pondering the woes of the world on this particular day. And he decided what the world needed was an emissary of beauty, form, and musical magic to bring joy to the troubled planet called Earth. So God said, let there be a man-child made in heaven and then put upon the earth. He'll grow tall and straight and handsome. I'll give him a loyal and loving heart filled with empathy and compassion. I will give him soulful eyes to warm many hearts. I will give him a majestic form and graceful poetic hands with which to express himself. I will make his voice of crushed velvet. And when he speaks and sings, untold beauty and joy will be heard around the world. I will bring forth into the world to bring people together, this man, and to give harmony to the lives of the multitudes. I will give him a wit and personality that will warm and thrill all who witness this heavenly child. I will give him riches and love beyond the imagination through all who experience this golden and chosen child. I will make him unique and irreplaceable in a world of duplication. I will present him to the world as a gift from God in heaven, and he will be called Elvis Aaron Presley. Now, you wrote that. That is... Uh that's beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. I, I, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, most of us think of Elvis as kind of the way I was talking about you, you know, like as a cartoon figure. Uh, we hardly can imagine that he was a, a real person like the person that you knew, uh, and you knew him, of course, better than most. It, it, it's hard for us to think of him that way. And then when you do think of him that way, it's very um, moving and sad to think of his early death. I mean, I... I um, I mentioned earlier, I remember where I was. The whole world knew yeah. the moment the king, Elvis, had passed. Now, you knew him all those years right until the end. Yes. So were you uh, friendly with him at that time when he passed away? I was. I um, uh, To go back just a little bit, in 1956, as a result of having met him in 54, Colonel Parker never forgave me for this because he wanted him to be paid for everything. But Elvis wanted to promote a show that he was doing in Memphis for charity for the Cynthia Milk Fund. I was doing a top 10 dance party show. I was sort of the Dick Clark of Memphis in those days. And he wanted to come on my show. He and Gladys and Vernon watch when he was in town every Saturday for an hour and a half for Coca-Cola. This, They love to watch the kids dance. So 
he wanted to promote the show that he was doing, and we knew each other, so he came on my show, and of course, I wanted him on like uh, he was hotter than, you know, baked bread and getting hotter every day, and we didn't have any videotape machines, so I thought to get a, a photographer to come in and set up a, 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 a 16 millimeter camera in front of the jukebox where I did my interviews, and I was the first person to ever do a filmed interview with Elvis, and again, this is 1956, he had just come back from Memphis from doing Love Me Tender, his very first movie. Holy cow. Yeah. So he just exploded. I mean, the idea that it's the summer of 54, yeah. he's nobody. And then you're saying two years later, he's just done his first film. That's correct. Uh, now, is there tape of that? Uh, I mean, you 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 recorded him in 56. Is that available anywhere? If somebody, well, the, enti- website? the entire interview is in that book. No, I mean the Verbatim. film. The film. Uh, I still have. I loaned it to a couple of people. The master. That shows how smart I am. Yeah. And it got torn apart over the years. But I have. I have a few minutes of it still available. And of course, I have the whole thing on audio. I, but I was on the air when he died. I, that's I was going to say. When we yeah. come back, I want to hear about this because this is forty-two years ago. You were just saying that you were on the air uh, when news of his passing flashed around the world. Yeah, that was. Uh, about 22 minutes after 2 o'clock Pacific time on this particular afternoon. And we all knew that Elvis had been in and out of the hospital. But uh, his impending death, nobody had any idea. Because, you know, a person like Elvis Presley, who's, Dick Clark said it, and I think it's true, there will never be another person quite like him on the planet. And you expect them to live forever. You just do. So I'm, it's 22 minutes after 2. Uh, and I'm on the air doing the final uh, hour of my show, noon to three, the KMPC. And the newsmen, everybody at the station knew of my relationship with Elvis. And I had just completed the Elvis Presley story, the best definitive uh, story of Elvis ever told on record. And so everybody knew of my relationship. And so the newsman who was on duty came in and whispered to me during a record. He said, I don't want to just break in and make this uh, bulletin, do this bulletin on the air without warning you first. And uh, he said, I just want you to know that uh, Elvis just passed. And so I, I thanked him. He went back in and, and the bulletin came on. And I still get chills when I uh, think about it. And I started to cry. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't continue. And so I just segued records and commercials until I got off the air at 3 o'clock. But it's, you know, it's like you say, you know, you know where you were when Kennedy was ass- assassinated in Dallas. You, you, you knew where you were and what you were doing the day Elvis died. Well, it, it's one of those things. I mean, I remember it was, um, obviously it was August, uh, and I was uh, – all of, I had just turned 14 and you know it's sort of like the whole world for a few days stopped yeah. I can't really explain it but it was just one of those uh, m- moments and um, but the fact that you were uh, on the air when you heard about that it is you know brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it because you loved him you knew him and it's so sudden he was 42 years old I mean that's the thing he was he was obviously very unhealthy very heavy um, it, 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 well, now, what was the last time you had seen him up till then? Well, Sandy, uh, on my birthday, the uh, prior year, she had taken me to see Elvis in Las Vegas. What year were we talking about? This was 76. Yeah. My birthday, December 4th, 76. And uh, he knew we were coming. He wanted us to come back between shows. That was He was at the International Hotel doing two shows a night. So between shows, we went back. Went into his uh, dressing room, of course, dressing room packed with people, and everybody got quiet as a mouse because it, they, he only wanted to talk to Sandy and me. And uh, that was when he was going with his uh, flavor of the moment, uh, Ginger Alden. That was his uh, so-called fiance. But anyway, she was over in the corner with Joe Esposito, his road manager. Everybody was there, but everybody was quiet. He only wanted to talk to Sandy and me. He had seen us that day on CBS on a show called Tattletales with Bert Convey about how much do you know about your spouse? 
Do you remember that show? I can tell you about Tattletales. I can tell you about Bert Convy. Uh, I didn't know that you were on there with yeah. Sandy. And we won that day. And he couldn't get over how much we knew about each other because he knew me from those early days in Memphis. He knew her because he had been dating her for a bunch oh, of years before we got married. So he couldn't get over how much. And he said one thing, which Sandy and I still laugh about to this day. He said, Wink, look at you. Look at your career. Look how well you've done. Look how successful you've become. And I thought, Elvis Presley is saying to me, look how well you've done. <laughs> well, you know, he was puffy. He didn't look good. And God only knows we knew that he probably was not going to have much more time on this planet. We left there that, that night. And we went back to our hotel room, Eric. We closed the door behind us and, and we literally broke down and sobbed. We were, it, it, it hit us like a ton of bricks. And we just knew that that, I said, Sandy, that's the last time we're going to see him alive. And now, it was. Look, he was 41 when you saw him. The idea that he could look so poor that you would know uh, that he was dying. I mean, what? Uh, well, if, he was if, in and out of the hospital a lot. And what, but what was, the, what was the issue with him? Uh, well, Sandy tells his story better than me, but it, it came down to the fact that during, during those touring days when Colonel Parker had him touring constantly, he'd finish one tour, go back to Memphis for two weeks and start another tour. So he was working constantly. And, you know, the kind of show he put on every night was very taxing. I mean, he worked hard when he went out on that stage and he said it best. He said, the only time I was really happy was when I was performing on stage. And he would, he would come off and he would have to take downers to put him to, himself to sleep and take uppers to wake him up and get him going for the next show. That sort of, that sort of idea. Well, you hear about that. The only person I can think of, you, you know, when you, when you, when you think of uh, Judy Garland. Yes. Same type of same, thing. Yeah, exactly. And not aware of the dangers of those drugs. That's and right. So using them and using them and using them. He never took hard drugs. He never did cocaine or marijuana, any of that. These were... Uh, he thought that because these drugs were prescribed by Dr. Nicopolis or his other doctors in Las Vegas, that it was fine. He said people around him, his Memphis Mafia tried to, several of them tried to get him to stop. And so you just knew that without exercise and, and, and as, as big as he was, that uh, he just wasn't going to be around that much longer. And it was it was somewhat frightening, you know, to think about it. But you just knew it was going. It was probably going to happen sooner than later. The idea that you knew after that concert, after talking to him backstage, that he was that sick—that's that, pretty dramatic. I mean, he was also very heavy. I, I think you you could. Oh yeah. As you said, he looked he looked unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you before we go because there are folks tuning in just thinking it's Wink Martindale from TV. I didn't know you had radio program. Uh, in 1977 while you were doing TV. So you were doing TV and radio constantly? Yeah. I, uh, uh, I came to Los Angeles in 1959, transferred there by RKO to KHJ Radio and Television. And I was doing radio on KHJ and doing a teenage dance party uh, in the summer of 59 when I made my record deck of cards, yeah. which sold a couple of million. A couple got, of million? Yeah, well, actually, you it's made, platinum now. You made a record that sold a couple of million? See, I... I love the idea that people have whole hidden careers that I'm completely unaware of. I did not know that you were recording artists. As yeah, Deck of say. Cards was a story of a soul. I recorded for Dot Records, Randy Wood, who started Pat Boone and other people. And I had a recording contract. And when I came out there, uh, he said, I'm going to look for a piece of material for you to record. And uh, I wasn't a singer, but uh, he said he found this this old record by T. Texas Tyler called Deck of Cards, story of a soldier in church who used a deck of cards because it didn't have a Bible. The ace was one God, the deuce was the Old and New Testament, and went through the Bible like that. Seriously, th I did not know that you recorded that. Yeah, and by November of that year, I got a call to come to New York and do it on the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, it was like an out-of-body experience. Excuse me, you sang on the Ed Sullivan Show? Well, I, I didn't sing, but I did my narration on the Ed Sullivan yeah. Show because it became... It went as high as number four on Cashbox and Billboard. And today, it's it's platinum. It's platinum? Yeah, I have a gold record, which I got from Dot, but it's uh, it continues to sell to this day. To this day, Eric, I have people come up to say, are you the same Wink Martindale who recorded Deck of Cards? And my answer is always the same. 
Do you think there are two people walking the earth with a silly name like <laughs> Winkman? <laughs> That's I mean, look. I even think that would be. But I'm are you the same Eric Metaxas? <laughs> well, I thought I'd heard of everything, but the fact that you were on Ed Sullivan, I mean, I would have started there. Really, just an honor, an honor to have you here. Uh, and we're not going to let you leave the building. Wink has not left the building.